Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them, what do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around, so now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a t terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, 
jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel, or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. Crazy. You just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family. Thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed Set box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed mover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. This poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, 
I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks, and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was like, an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, Andrew, is, uh, is this you? What? There is no lighter way to put this. We talked about a court jester or a fool, but did you know that some medieval royal courts had professional farters? Yes, that's people whose sole purpose in life was to fart. I'm still trying to figure out how Andrew can fart on command, but these guys did it as a job. These guys would fart their way to being rewarded with houses and lands for their fartscapades. Fartscapades that would include passing their intestinal wind in unique, creative, musical, or amusing ways. <laughs> I wonder, if, I wonder if the mic picked that up. This quote I found from St. Augustine in City of God says, these talented individuals had, quote unquote, such a command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. The most famous of the medieval flatulists, no, that's not a joke, that's actually what they're called, was Roland the Farter from Hemingstone Manor in the county of Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, who could shoot water up to five feet? He could squirt water out of his bum. Well farting. Ready? Need some water? <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, arrange marriages. Today, the marriage industry makes millions every year. Flowers, design, and of course, the bridal dresses. It's a good business, especially once the weather starts to warm up. You got options today, ladies. Sleeves or no sleeves, veil or no veil, and thousands of other dress designs that I simply just don't understand. But the beauty of it all is that you get to marry the man of your dreams. Hi. <laughs> I'm not the man of their dreams, let's be honest. <laughs> or at least the best smelling one in your social circle. Definitely not me. However, for the ladies of the past, they sometimes didn't get to pick their man as her family or royal court would. A lot of marriages, especially on the high ups, were often more of a political move uh, than that of a romantic one. Sure, marrying for an alliance sounds cool, but man, dinner time would be like a blind date every night. That's, that's just super awkward. So like, uh, like, where are you from? What's going on? Yeah. Number eight, keys to the city. You know when people say that someone got the keys to the city as a way of saying that person can do whatever they want? Well, that came from the medieval times. You see, back in ye olden times, if you lived in a walled city when nighttime hit, they locked those gates up tight. Don't want some slimy bandits, enemy soldiers, or unwanted flatulists coming and going in the city in the dead of the night. Someone who was particularly well liked or who had done something noteworthy to gain the respect, trust, and admiration of the people would be given a key to the city, giving them the free reign to come and go as they please. We actually still do this, but obviously most cities don't really have walls anymore, so it's more of a symbolic thing like, hey, you're great, have this little key that opens literally nothing. You're welcome. Number seven, graveyards. If you're like me, then you've seen enough zombie movies to know that hanging around a graveyard is the last place you want to be. It's their spawn point, duh. And every time you drive by a graveyard, you think to yourself some zombie related thoughts, but dare not tell anyone for fear of sounding like a weird guy for talking about zombies rising out of the graves because it's sunny out and that's, that just sounds like a tale from the crypt episode. Well, medieval people didn't have fears of George A. Romero's movies or that weird corpse guy in Tales of the Crypt Keeper, as people like to hang out in the graveyards. 
Weird, I know. In medieval times, they were just a part of the town. There weren't really a lot of fences or like barriers. Sometimes there would be plays, small festivals, and even shops set up in graveyards since graveyard shops pay no tax. I guess you could say shop till you drop it. <laughs> All bad impressions aside, I'll stay away, especially with the diseases going around back then. Number six, cat burning. Excuse me, evil. Medieval people just hated cats. A lot of the ye old people thought cats were symbols or allies of the big red with the horns. And yeah, they aren't the most pleasant of animals, but I love my cat. Yeah. Not that one. Unfortunately, in the Middle Age France, it was custom to burn a barrel full of live cats over a burning fire every Midsummer's Eve, as people shrieked with laughter and danced around with glee. French kings often witnessed it and even ceremoniously started the fire. But they did much more than that too, like King Charles IX, who threw a live fox onto the fire for added variety. Or in 1648, Francis King Louis XIV, then aged just 10, lit the tinder on a large bonfire in central Paris, then watched and danced with glee as a basket of stray cats was lowered into the flames. A man who wrote to his brother about the celebration of coronation of Queen Elizabeth I wrote, Last Saturday, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was solemnized in the city with mighty bonfires and the burning of a most costly pope, carried by four persons in diverse clothing, his belly filled full of live cats, who squalled most hideously as soon as they felt the fire. What the hell? Number five, castles. Besides a knight in shining armor, what's the first thing you think of when you think of medieval times? Castles, yeah, obviously. Yes, I'm talking about castles, but bear with me here, just hear me out. Okay, so when we were kids, we all wanted to live in a huge mansion, right? I mean, who doesn't? I wouldn't though, because, well, it would be a pain in the neck to clean. As you grow up, you start thinking about weird things like that. It'd be really difficult to clean, but it's a common wish nonetheless. Well, castles basically are medieval mansions, except with a little twist. These. Castles are also designed with military strategy in mind. So imagine, if you will, you have a world where your parents have a mansion, uh, but they had to add guard towers and an armory and a battalion of soldiers just in case the next kingdom over gets a, a little too frisky. The positioning of the castle was also very important too. Some built by the coast on top of hills and even some inside of mountains all in the name of protection. To me, that's like some purge level reality where wealthy homes have to be built with the fences in mind. It's kind of messed up. Number four, fair. Punishments for crime in the Middle Ages were different from they are today. Capital punishment happens now still, like it did then, but we don't really put people into exile so much anymore. Unless you count the prison system, but th that's another conversation altogether. Back in medieval Ireland though, someone who de-lifed someone else and was judged to be guilty was given to the deceased's family as their unwilling servant. That is, if they failed to pay the oodles of money required to buy their freedom. As we know, people who were forced into manual labor were not treated too nicely. And they were pretty much had no rights at all, being seen as property more than an individual. This means that the family that now owns said person could do whatever they wanted with them. Their life was basically forfeit. Now, if the person who ended the life of one of your beloved family members was now given to you to do whatever you wanted with them, what would you do? Yes, yes, me too, mm -hmm. probably. It seems fair to me. Leave the punishment to those who are most affected by the crime. Number three, Shark Week. Aunt Flo, she shows up sometimes during those delightful few days that ladies have. I hear you, I know. I'm not a lady, I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to relate to the audience. But have you ever wondered how things were dealt with before the modern world of feminine hygiene products? Today, you got options, but back then, well, they didn't really exist. Ladies had to come up with methods, and honestly, the beginnings of what the products would eventually evolve into. A lot of times, it was extra cloth or rags were used, perhaps where the expression on the rag may have come from. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no issue talking about this because it's natural, it's a part of life. I'm a grown up, dude. The tradition of this point is in the tradition of hiding it or being ashamed. That's what started in medieval times, too, unfortunately. And sadly, it's carried over to today just a little bit. Some even consider cramps to be a punishment for Eve's original sin back then, which is just so stupid. Things have gotten a little better, but I, I think you can all agree with me, ladies. It's time for everyone else to grow up a little bit. A number two, trick or treat, it's Christmas. What? <laughs> Sorry. In Northern Europe and Scandinavian countries, Yule time meant adopting the tradition we are familiar with from modern Halloween. Dressing up like your favorite spooky characters, or what it is now, trying to one-up your friends with the hottest insert occupation here costume you can. 
They didn't dress up as sexy cats or nurses though. But from the day of Christmas to the twelfth night, young men would dress up according to quote unquote the old fashion of the devil and go around in the night scaring people in the streets. These young spunky lads would go about as ghosts, trolls, or other strange creatures. And in the 16th and 17th century, some men would even dress as the Yule Goat, terrifying children and coming into people's houses demanding cake or cheese, then pleasantly thanking them if he received something, or whacking them with a stick if he didn't. Then the goat would just hop on out of there like this. That was cute, dude. Hey, man. Number one, Lord's Right. This one is just so messed up. Okay, so back in the medieval times, imagine if you will that you've just been married to a beautiful woman. Just finished walking down the aisle when the local lord of the land makes a surprise appearance at your wedding. At first you bow and welcome his lordship. That's when he grabs your blushing bride to be and looks at you with the snobbiest look a royal could and says, sorry bud, lord's right, gotta take her for a test drive to make sure everything's great. Yes, that's right, there was a law, or a code, if you will, that allowed lords to entertain wives for a few hours. Or like a few seconds. You must also imagine this is a time when speaking out against lords for doing so would not have bode well for you or your wife, so best just go along with the plan. Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spine needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different, it's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Les Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, Beavers! It's my national animal, and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states, who for sure eat this, but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough, it's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kind of how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like it's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. 
Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's his, his gabagool, you know, his, uh, his wiener von schnitzel miner. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal. Even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms up there who do great work. You're the best. Way to go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point, it's kinda gross, but at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious, enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep gabagool while you're at it, why not, you know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grueling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner and on top of that, they're sowing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle. Just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a entrail pie? Oh, that must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great. You guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions. And honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun and watching reality TV shows when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention and it's Hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then, thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just wanna pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please, more like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. 
Number 9. The Crusades A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in 6 million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings. The elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, no, no. We need fear way more fear. Number 8. The Magna Carta The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathersworth, peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number 7. The Battle of Bannockburn This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, aka Pestilence, aka the Great Mortality, or simply known as the Plague. Single handedly, the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where Bless You comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number 4. 
Henry V, another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink cause they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories all part of the mystery. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. 
Shawshank Redemption 2, Medieval Edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's Civil War. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Be like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight, stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, the backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. Yeah. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I got to drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal, that's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages, what can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War, Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, AKA feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. 
With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess, that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale, or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then, and only then, do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was the cults, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way. We're all dancing. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. 
Common cold? Have I got a solution for you. Bloodletting, especially by way of bleach, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our Number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today we have the groom of the stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the groom of the stool comes in, this high level noble Men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number seven spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the the shittiest jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous, too. I mean, if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease, and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. 
person. You know, both bad. In our number five spot today, we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. Well, there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people. History shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people, of course, saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience. Other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence. And most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious. Another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number four spot today, we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number three spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connection were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring. It's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cockentrice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was a another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig. Because 
why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Franciscan monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass, but he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid, and flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, Time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law, and so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attack hacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the Saints Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindon. Stock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these 
students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread, and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex, and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. For number 5, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era? It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modest statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of, to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought, and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now, there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death, even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Fomorphe the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be 
be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to upsurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Morpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Number 10 is sumptuary laws. Which are the most common kind of medieval law? Defined as laws made for the purpose of restraining luxury or extravagance, particularly against inordinate expenditures for apparel, food, furniture, and etc. Sumptuary laws were enacted for the purpose of regulating trade, but also regulate and reinforce social hierarchies by restricting foods, clothing, and luxury items. They did this so it was easy to identify someone's social rank and privilege in the name of good old fashioned social discrimination and class division. Bourgeois subjects appearing to be as wealthy or as wealthier than ruling nobility could undermine the royals presentations as the most powerful in the land. Why, that could cause traitors and thieves and revolts. In late medieval cities, sumptuary laws were instituted as a way for nobility to limit the conspicuous consumption of everyone, most specifically the prosperous bourgeoisie, while still making it about poor commoners enough for it to slip past them while they were busy poking fun at those below them, they missed out what the royals sneakily did above them. Cowardice tax law is number nine. Medieval knights weren't always volunteers. In fact, a grand majority of many kingdoms functioned off of what was essentially a drafting of their men into the service. So it makes sense that not everyone was as passionate about the idea of sieges or holy crusades or anything that could really get them wiped out in the name of a cause that just wasn't for them. So while it could be considered a great honor to be called to battle and you wanted to shirk your duty of obligation, you technically were able to pay a scourge, AKA the cowardice tax tax, which originated in 1100. Essentially a get out of jail free card that you paid for with your own wage, royalty started to lean into this new tax source and by the 13th century it had evolved into a generalized tax on the knight's land. When the scourge tax reached 300%, the result of one king's want to force those to serve him all in a total Icarus flies too close to the sun fashion, it led to the implementation of the Magna Carta, which was forced onto royalty in the times to stunt their seemingly endless control and dictatorship. Sports banning is number eight. You've heard it in some of our other medieval videos, but we'll dive more into it now. Soccer and tennis were two banned sports of the medieval era. Handball, club ball, which is essentially baseball. Hand fighting, which we could call boxing, I guess. This law, which was made in 1485, was due to the belief that British men were losing their legendary archery skills and also that these sports led to the sin of gambling. Obviously, the rules didn't apply to royalty, really, so tennis actually became an exclusively upper class sport 
for its etiquette, complex rules, and equipment requirements. Meanwhile, football, as you may already know, was absolutely brutal. There was violence leading up to deaths and serious injuries, and it was often played drunk and recklessly. In 1388, a national statute demanded that servants and laborers throughout the country stop playing football and other sports and practice archery instead, the latter being necessary for the defense of the realm. They reopened the law in 1410 to add the punishment of six days imprisonment for violating this rule. Even then, it was only enforced sporadically as royals were still depicted playing this game during the time of its illegality. Unlike others, this, this law obviously is not still in place today. This older legislation concerning unlawful games was repealed in 1845. Number seven says you're not for the streets if you do these things in them. There were a few smaller rules written in correlation with street behavior in medieval times. While it was okay to toss your feces just about anywhere, in 1839, a law imposed it be illegal to beat or shake any carpet or rug in the street. You can shake your doormat, however, but only before 8 a.m. in the morning. No carolers allowed then. It was illegal to sing songs and ballads in the street, especially if it was profane. And if you were to disturb the people by ringing doorbells or knocking on doors unexpectedly and unwantedly, you could be fined. Try enforcing that on Halloween. Meanwhile, in Scotland, it is still illegal to date to turn someone away if they knock at your door and ask to use your bathroom, no matter the time, place, age, or person. Spotted in a crowd is unfortunately number six. Why unfortunately? Well, another fun, sumptuary law, and one of the earliest ever made in Europe, governed the appearance of minorities and social groups. Enacting laws stating specific dress codes for religions such as Jews or Muslims so that they were easily to be identified from other people. In English colonies, Muslims were told to wear a crescent-shaped brooch or badge, while Jews had to wear a similar badge, as well as a ring and a yellow cone-shaped hat. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty noticeable in a crowd. Alongside people who were Muslim or Jewish, the royals regulated laws of fashion towards people with certain diseases, those not following Christianity as a religion, orphans, and women of the night. Essentially, as you can tell, these were the unwanted peoples in the kingdom. So unfortunately, as mentioned, the point of these garbs was to make these people noticeable as social outcasts, so they may face mockery and degradation they didn't deserve for just simply existing. Number five is the Russian beard tax. All right, so this technically was just outside the realm of medieval times and into middle times, but in 1698, Russian Emperor Peter the Great placed a tax on beards, hoping to force men to adopt the clean-shaven look that was common in Western Europe. Peter's goal was to shift Russia to an Eurocentric visual. His return from a two-year escapade in Europe had him changing up the fashion trends as well, replacing their long, familiar Russian overcoats with French or Hungarian-style jackets. They were shorter in length. It meant anyone walking the streets in an old-fashioned robe was liable to have it cut short by Peter's designated fashion inspectors. The same inspectors would approach any bearded man they saw, requesting to see his beard token, a silver coin with a leafed edge, and in the center, a mustache, nose, and beard. This token was given to men who had paid their legally mandated beard tax for the year. No token provided when asked? Doesn't matter if you forgot it at home. The inspectors would cut your beard off on the spot or simply rip it out of your face. The Russian Orthodox Church, which hated Peter the Great, saw this as a downright scandal as their teachings considered uncut facial hair a reflection of piety, seeing as man was created in the image of God, which included a beard. To shave it was a grave sin, but the church never really could stop Peter or his wily goals. This beard tax remained in place until 1772. Nowadays, these beard tokens are actually extremely rare collectibles, selling for as much as $10,000 in auctions today. Number four tells you don't mess with royal animals, whether it's eating them, hunting them, or breeding them. The royals had some rules for their medieval animals. First up is how in 1332, a statute passed established the king shall have throughout the realm whales and great sturgeons taken in the sea or elsewhere within the realm. In normal English terms, what they're saying is any whales or sturgeons that were caught or washed up on crown ruled soil, it had to first be offered to royalty before being pilfered. This law is actually still in place today, but rarely ever actualized on. However, in 2004, a fun Welsh fisherman diligently complied with the law by offering a sturgeon he had caught to the queen herself she politely declined the offer. Interestingly enough, the provisions of this statute are expressly protected from repeal by the Wild Creatures and Forest Laws Act of 1971, as it ensures hunting these animals is minimized. Wanna offend a royal? No? Pay attention to your dog, as it's an offense to let your dog mate with any dog belonging to a royal family member. Queen Elizabeth II's corgis of modern day are included, as this law is also still valid now. There were animal laws that weren't just for royals, however, a law said that keeping a pigsty in 
front of your home was illegal unless it was well hidden. You also weren't allowed to be in charge or ride horses and cows if you were intoxicated. The first drunk driving regulations. And as you may know, even animals could face the judge and jury in animal court for their crimes. Number three, we discuss how excessive food consumption led to restrictive laws on how food and drink were to be made, sold, and consumed. This is a great example of sumptuary laws from the point 10, where the royalty is irritated by blurring lines between them and the bourgeoisie. In 1309, Edward II criticized the outrageous and excessive multitude of meats and dishes that the nobles were eating, emulating the lifestyle of their superiors. So Edward III, in 1336, enacts a law that would have made his daddy proud. No man of whatever rank he shall be shall be served a meal with more than two courses except for certain festivals such as Christmas on which three courses were allowed. Edward III said that many mischiefs caused by the many sorts of costly meats which people in this realm had used was the reason for this decision. But seeing as commoners were practically starving to death at the time, it's obvious where this law was pointed. These laws may or may not have influenced the behavior, but there was no real evidence of any actual enforcement of them. So despite this, the statute wasn't repealed until 1856, but there was no proof of it being used. Scold, and no, not what your mom does when you don't clean your room, is number two. The word scold was used as a legal term for women who disturbed their peers or husbands' peace with quarreling, gossiping, slander, brawling, or even just talking too much. Imagine he left his socks on the floor again, you tell him to put them away, and boom, just like that, you're a scold. While being a scold wasn't a crime, it was criminally punishable, and they had quite a few imaginative and funky ways in which to do so, such as a scold's brittle, which is an iron cage lit or mouth that encases the mouth exterior and interior, ensuring that the woman's mouth opens or even her tongue moves, metal spikes would lacerate and puncture her. Sometimes they would even add insult to injury by parading the woman around town in the brittle to face scorn or by chaining her to a fireplace where she could inhale ash and soot and desperately try not to cough lest she gets the brittle spikes. There was also a yoke, a type of wooden restraint that could either hold one or two people. A woman could be married to wear one alone, sent walking for hours under the disproportionate weight as a punishment, or she might be locked up with the woman she was fighting with, in which case you don't have the discomfort of the weight, but you do have the discomfort of staring at your rival's ugly mug for a while. Doing the do and when to comes in at number one. In medieval times, there were numerous religious laws enacted that aimed to restrict the act of reproduction and the times in which it could be done. In a seven day week, a married couple could only engage four of the days. Thursday and Fridays were no no days as people were supposed to prepare for the Holy Communion, and Sunday as well because it was was the Lord's Day. In a year itself, the 47 to 62 days of Lent and then the 40 to 60 days of the Feast of Pentecost, relations were prohibited. For the 35 days leading up to Christmas, it was also banned. Anyways, medieval folks considered the eyes important in regards to a person's sexual appetite, so it was also encouraged not to make eye contact during banned periods with someone if you're attracted to them. That I can actually kind of get. It is a romance movie trope after all. Anyways, outside of a religious factor, abstinence during Lent ensured no babies would be born during winter time periods when food was scarce and it was harder to endure pregnancy. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the Ninth had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes 
to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently, it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50 50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number eight spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 100 20 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number seven spot today, we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891, until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he could put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes, instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed, again, and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, all right? So I guess the other pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up imagining that he was St. George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known 
for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the new world at this point brought something less than lovely back with them and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She divided a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known of events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men all wearing Persian silk along with 12,000 slaves who each carried 4 pounds of gold bars and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British 
British Isles, the Netherlands, northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of Saint Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second, because there is another. The first Saint Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pukoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in him. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations. They've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious, while peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage at purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church law stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages, during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love, since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For 
most part, there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like, hey, we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD, there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair, and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up, watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned, courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture, and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture, it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England, tournaments were in full swing, usually consisting of jousting and melees, a big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church, however, complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal, and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry, if sword fighting isn't your forte, then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. And remember, when meeting a beloved, dress to impress, but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumptuary laws exist. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a date to wear their best gown and hose, which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed to learn Learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family home of your potential lover, and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed, and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food, but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carry the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating, but don't eat with it. 5. Okay, if it's a liquid, use a spoon. People tended to eat with their hands for everything else. 6. Don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And 7. You can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so. And 8. Remember, you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously, some of these things like wiping your hands on a table tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the Middle Ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling, bro. I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the Middle Ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples. Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away. Romeo and Juliet taking their lives, and the raving madness of Ophelia. But these are just drama Dramatizations, right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled. But with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable Attainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society, the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being
being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot, so let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up, so let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful, and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin, such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hare's blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured. Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the middle ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009 and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plaid carrying hair bringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around, but with those blank dead fish eyes, bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five, and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now, being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team, and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the Middle Ages too, after half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions, and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism, and as a result, the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a 
bucket and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point, she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them, and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household, who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it, and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you, he's called a peer collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling, my generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new, and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe. Your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities. So you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. Because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls, in which vertical wooden stakes, or wattles, are woven with horizontal twigs and branches, and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep, and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air Area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye-waterily smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the dark age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found 
around in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, nun was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that to today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy, not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously, partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide, well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impacy trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread rice. So guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death? Why? Because for some reason stripe clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295 Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310 in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he'd been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references, it's ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks, and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek, when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools, and of all things, like why that, and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy, and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around one in five peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training, so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well if this tool works on my farm, for this it'll work 
for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful, so you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. Alright, so evidently whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side-eyeing you and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet. What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych, that still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, massive 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the Enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run-of-the-mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap, too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote, grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls, or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then.